back up here and sing that at the end again. Okay, Audrey? <laughs> Hallelujah. There is nothing greater than seeing your children grow in the Lord as you're raising them up in the way that they should go. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I'm just so thankful for what the Lord's been doing in our lives lately. And I know I had shared this morning a little bit about what I have been through personally this week, which is why um, I sound so hoarse. So if y'all would bear with me, <laughs> um, Jacob might have come out with a limp, but <laughs> a broken hip. I have a broken voice, but glory be to God, I, I wouldn't trade it. For the experience that I've been through, I will gladly carry this light affliction. <laughs> Glory to God. And so I just prayed that the Lord would give me the strength and the ability to come before you tonight with this word. And I, I believe he has. He has given me strength. He touched me even again this morning as we were praying. And he even restored more of my voice. And so... Um, as we go, I'm going to do the best I can, and I hope that it'll be a blessing to you, and we'll just see how far we can get, but glory to God, I believe our God is a healer. <laughs> I know our God is a healer, and I know that he is touching me even now, and so if you would go with me to the book of Judges. The Lord laid this on my heart when he touched me this week. And I just felt led to share this with you. I knew that I had to share this portion of scripture. This comes from Judges chapter 4. And I'm going to begin with verse 17. Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray you, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. Again, he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man does come and inquire of you and say, Is there any man here that you shall say no? And Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it to the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin, king of Canaan, before the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, and they, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. And my message for you tonight is she took a nail of the tent and a hammer in her hand. Glory to God. She took a nail of the tent and a hammer in her hand. Pray with me tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus, O oh God. You are the one who gives us strength. You are the one who causes us to prevail over our enemies. You alone give the victory, O oh God. We are just mortal human beings, but with God, we know all things are possible. We know with God you are able to quicken these mortal bodies, to fill us with your precious Holy Spirit, and empower us for the days ahead, O oh God. Lord, to do the work you've called us to do. Lord, I pray for each and every one who's here tonight. 
tonight, that this word, Lord, would stir their heart, that it would strengthen them and cause them, Lord, to rise up. Lord, stretch our faith tonight to believe you for bigger and greater things, Lord, than we ever thought imaginable. Lord, we believe these are the days of miracles. We believe you are the miracle-working God, and you are able, Lord, to do all that we ask, Lord. And Father, we just pray tonight that your precious Holy Spirit would be amongst us, O oh Lord. Pour out your spirit. I pray for an anointing touch upon me, Father, as I speak your word, Lord, that it would be you and not me, O oh God. That I would decrease, Father, as you would give the increase. And Father, I pray you touch these people tonight. Oh, Lord, meet their needs, Lord. We're asking for miracles in their life, healings, every need supplied tonight, Lord, for that wayward son or daughter to come back to you, oh, God. Oh, Lord, for that financial need to be met, Lord. Oh, Father, whatever the need is, we believe that you are able to do it. And, Father, we give you all the praise and honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. He is able tonight. Glory to God. And as we were here last Sunday night and we were praying in the altars, I'm going to share a little bit of what I shared this morning. I, I felt a heaviness upon me, and I had been feeling this lately, that the devil had been oppressing me. He's been coming after me hard, and I know there's many of you out here, too, who have shared that you feel this, too. You feel that the devil's really coming against you. And there's a reason for that. I heard someone say this week that Satan knows his time is up. He knows this thing is almost over. And he is unleashing the powers of hell on God's people. He's going to go down swinging with everything he's got. So fully expect opposition. But be prepared. And know that our God is able to deliver you from the hand of your enemy. He is able to heal your sick body. He is able to give you strength when you are weak. He is able to give you that word in a time of need when you're trying to witness to somebody and you're hitting a brick wall. It's by his spirit we are able to do these things you can go forth in boldness and in power through the name of Jesus Christ and I want to encourage you tonight to believe for that you are able and he is all you need and as I was praying I felt I had already been dealing with having trouble with my voice but I just felt like something was keeping me from being able to speak out and um, through the brokenness, I was able to praise the Lord, and, and I felt like I had really won a victory, but I knew that the war wasn't over. And, and I went home that night, and we, we were in these altars praying until 9 or 9.30. We didn't get home till about midnight. And um, in the night, I had a dream, and I don't fully understand exactly what this dream means, but... In my dream, several of us were at a campground. We were all there together outside, and um, I came face to face with some of the people in the past who persecuted me, and they were trying to persuade me to do some things that I didn't feel comfortable with, and they were saying things like, we'll get you in, and we'll get you over here, and it's going to be all right, and, and we'll help you, and we'll show you, and I just wasn't liking the way I was feeling, and I looked up, and I saw there were long tables with full, that were full of people, and these people were just sitting, and they were eating, and, and I remember seeing the face of one very precious pastor that... Um, he attends Family Worship Center. He sits on the platform. And he came down about a, a year ago when we were at camp last year. He came to me and he spoke a word into my heart. And he gave me a word of encouragement. And he said, the Lord says that he has called you, but you are being hindered. But he wants you to know that he has made you to be like Nehemiah. And he has put you on the wall. So don't come down for anything or anybody. And he said, get ready, though, because you stir up the demons of hell and get ready for your battle scars. 
and I had no idea just how true those words would be, but how they would carry me through the coming months. He said, stay on the wall. Don't come down. And you stay on the wall. And the Lord just kept that word in my heart. And I saw this man. He's sitting at the table and he's eating and he's not worried. And I'm thinking, what's going on? I, you know, I'm, I'm over here struggling and I got to get over there. And all of a sudden, there were these um, authorities that stood up and said that they were going to start separating the people and they were going to take the, the men away from the women. And I just felt like I was being pushed. And suddenly there were fires around. And I turned and I'm at the edge of a cliff and I look down and the water is raging. There's like a river. And I turned around and I thought, I, Lord, what am I going to do? And then I woke up. And I didn't understand, but I was reminded of Jesus and how he was persecuted. He went back to his hometown of Nazareth and he tried to preach and they took him to the edge of the cliff and they were ready to throw him over. And all I could think of was, I got to get to that table. I got to get to that place where those people are, where they were sitting, where they were eating. And I just feel like that was the word that the Lord had for me was get to that table because Troubles coming and persecutions coming from individuals and there will be fires and floods and signs and wonders and all sorts of things that are going to be coming against you. But if you're at that table, you're not even going to notice because you're going to be there where there is provision. And the Lord really began to work on my heart about that. I woke up that morning thinking about that and I went to speak and I couldn't. I had completely lost my voice. Now, I have been a singer my entire life, and I have never had this problem before. <laughs> and um, Jeff and I were joking about this because he's like, I don't ever remember you not being able to speak. And, and the kids were saying, it's so quiet around the house because she's always <laughs> singing and talking, you know. And I just felt like there was a reason that the Lord wanted me to be still so that he could speak to my heart. And although I was feeling this oppression from the devil, the Lord was saying, I'm allowing you to feel this so you will know exactly what you're dealing with. So you will know how to take hold of that thing and rebuke the devil when he comes your way. And you'll be able to recognize it in others so that you can help them. And he began to deal with me that his grace is sufficient he began to deal with me about stretching my faith and believing him for more. You know, we don't need to be like doubting Thomas. I, I'm not going to believe until I see the nail scars in his hand. He rebuked Thomas. He, he said, you don't have any faith at all. You are faithless. What a thing to be said of you. He said, but you are still blessed. But the greater blessing is for those who believe and have it seen. Can we just start believing God for the impossible things instead of being the critic on the sidelines like, oh, I don't know about that. I'm not so sure about that. Just get in and let go and he will direct you. He will give you discernment. He will order your steps. He will show you, no, no, don't do that. Don't go there. But you got to step out. You got to give him something to work with first. And I'm the kind of person that wants the plan laid out for me before I'll make a move. It is hard to step out when you feel like you're in the midst of darkness. You can't even see the light. You don't know where you're headed. You don't know what is about to happen next. I can't tell you what the future holds, but I know my God is on the throne. And I know he's going to stay there. Glory to God. There is nothing that will happen to you. That he doesn't will or allow. And it's all through his grace that he will see you through. I began to seek him for grace. For grace to go through this. Because I knew that I was fighting spiritual warfare. The devil will come to me and he will speak things into my mind. And he will tell me that I am not worthy. That I am not called that I'm not able to do this. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you been there before? 
And understand this, we aren't worthy on our own, but through God, because he has called you. It's his calling for you. He has anointed you. He will empower you to do it. If you qualified already, he wouldn't get the glory. He said that he would make me a living testimony of his glory because people know that I can't in my own ability do it. They know that it's God. Glory to God. He's going to get the glory. And I would listen to these lies, and I would say, yeah, that's true. That is right. And, and I thought that was keeping me humble. You know, yeah, yeah, you know, that, that's true. That's right. I'm going to just, you know, and I would feed in, into those thoughts. I would let that take seed in my heart. And it's like the Lord was saying, wake up. Don't listen to that. You know who you are in me. You know you are called. You are chosen. You are anointed for a purpose for such a time as this. Daughter, rise and be about my business. I just really felt like he was dealing with my heart to rebuke those thoughts when they come into my mind. And the whole day went by, and I I was just barely able to speak above a whisper. And I just felt like... The um, the chapter in Hebrews chapter 12 where the Lord said, no chastening for the moment is joyous. It's not meant to be joyful, but in the end it brings about the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Glory to God that he chastens those that he loves. He loves you enough to get your attention, to get a hold of you, to take some things from you, to show you that you need to get your focus back on him. And I'm so thankful that he does that out of his great love for us. So don't resist the chastening of the Lord. The word of God says that it makes you illegitimate. You don't even belong to him if you try to resist the chastening of the Lord. Well, by Wednesday morning, I still didn't have a voice. And I got up that morning and I made a pot of coffee and I was just praying. And I went to grab the handle. (laughs) of the coffee pot, and, and I just felt like the Lord said, fast. And I was like, right now? <laughs> you know, how many of you love your morning cup of coffee? I mean, my goodness, Lord. <laughs> we were talking about that this morning. And I said, okay, I will. I'll fast tomorrow. Uh, I can be prepared for it. You know, I'll think about that all day and get myself mentally prepared. And I'll, you know, so let's do it tomorrow. Okay, how about that? And I went to grab that coffee pot. And he said, fast. And I said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. Yes, I knew that the Lord was laying that on my heart. And I thought about David. And how um, he sent his mighty men. They, they heard him say how in the heat of the battle, he longed for that drink of water out of the, the well of Bethlehem. Yeah. And his mighty men, they broke through the strongholds. They, they fought through uh, to get to the other side to go and get him a cup of water out of that well. And they, they brought it back to him and they risked their lives to bring him that cup of water. And when they brought it to him, he just poured it out. He, he poured it out as a drink offering to the Lord. Now, I didn't take my coffee pot outside and have a ceremony and pour it out in the yard or anything. Don't, don't think that. Okay, we're under a new covenant. <laughs> Better promises. But glory to God. I did. I thought about that moment and how he must have felt, which what I was going through was nothing compared to what David was going through. But I did. I said, I'm going to let that whole pot of coffee go to waste. And I, I'm going to seek the face of the Lord today. And the Lord began to deal with me on Wednesday about um, offenses and how easily we can become offended. Um, I didn't think about it like this, but how easily you're offended is a direct indication of your spiritual maturity or immaturity. <laughs> How easily are we offended when things come against us, when people say things against us, or when they they come with a rebuke and we don't want to accept that? And and perhaps when we get upset because we don't get the outcome that we desired, 
We get offended at others because they don't perform to this level that we have imagined for them to be. And we're so hard on one another. Or maybe jealousy creeps into your heart because you feel that you're called too, but you haven't had that opportunity. Someone else gets the opportunity. Um, but just know God has a plan for your life and he's going to use you on his terms and he opens doors no man can shut. And like Brother Luke, he was saying this morning, you try so hard to make it happen for yourself and climb that ladder. God can do so much more when you surrender to him than anything that you could do on your own. And the fruit will be real and it will be great. And so we... We should, though, expect that others will come against us. I mean, if you're in ministry, you learn real quick that there are going to be offenses. There are going to be people who will disagree with you. And so you just kind of grow a backbone, you know, get some thick skin and get ready for your battle scars. But if you keep your focus on Jesus... Those things just roll right off of you. Those little offenses that used to be such a big deal, it just doesn't matter anymore. You can be happy for your neighbor when they're prosperous. And know that God has a plan for your life to bless you on his own time and just trust in that. And I got to thinking about, you know, we peek over the other side of the fence so often. You just want to see what's going on over there and you just lose your focus on what God has given you. Labor in the field where he has placed you. And if you're so busy being about your father's business and the call he's placed on your life, you're not even going to have time to worry about what's going on over the fence. You're too busy watering your own grass. You're too busy with the fruit that he's given you. So you just got to get wrapped up in Jesus. Just complete, you know, that song wrapped up, tied up, tangled all up in Jesus. That's how I want to be wrapped up, tied up, tangled all up in Jesus. Glory to God. When he's the center of it all, you don't have to worry about all those little offenses that come your way. And he began to deal with me about being prepared to give an account like first Peter tells us to do of this hope that is in you to be ready to answer any man's questions when they come to you for what you believe young people you've got to believe this for yourself not just because mom and daddy told you there's going to be a day when you're going to be standing alone defending your faith do you really believe it or not because if you don't it's not going to stand the test you're not going to be able to win the battle against the devil when you're standing there against someone else and they're debating you on this topic. You've got to know that you know you are rooted and grounded, anchored in this thing, that he has made himself real to you. So I encourage you to have a real relationship with the Lord, to just press in daily into his presence. Be in his word. Let him move in your heart and show you what he's called you to do. You are not too young to be used. You are a light now in these dark days. He is using you now. Don't think, oh, I'll get it figured out someday. You don't have to wait to share this gospel. So I just want to encourage you to go forth. Let him touch you. Let him anoint you and use you. Glory to God. So by Thursday, this is day four, and I still have no voice, and I'm getting to that, does he not care that I perish, you know, kind of feeling, like, Lord, this is getting rough. I'm starting to feel like Zachariah is going to need to find me a tablet and write, his name is John, you know, am I going to get him my voice back? What, what do I have to do or deal with my doubt and unbelief and the things that, that are hindering me? And uh, I know that there were others who were praying for me, too. And it was in, in that moment of desperation. I mean, you got to get desperate if you really want something from God. You've heard it said that desperation precedes revelation. So we may go through some things where we have something taken from us and, and we lose an ability for a small time. So that he can show us things and get us into a place. You know, you feel that pressure. You feel that squeeze. You feel that he's working on you. And um, 
I just began to seek the face of the Lord, and that is when he gave me this word that I will give you a voice. I will restore your voice, and it will be a voice. As one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Repent and make ready for his soon return. He said, I will make you as Deborah and Jael. I have put the hammer in your hand to drive it through those opposing evil forces of darkness. He said, I've made you a mighty warrior for me, and I'm sending you forth so you can make a way for others. Glory to God. And I just felt it welling up in me, and I just couldn't hold my peace any longer, and I began to just pray to the Lord, restore my voice. Give me strength, Lord, if this is of you. I need you to touch me right now. And the Lord just began to open up my vocal cords, and I began to just praise the Lord. I I just began to say glory to God and the Lamb forever and ever who reigns, who is seated high upon the throne, and his train fills the temple. Glory to God. And I began to speak in other tongues. And I just began to say, Blessed is his holy name. Oh God Almighty, who alone is like our God. Glory to God. Glory to God. And I was loud, but it sounded awful. And the dog started howling and barking. And Amelia came running out in the front yard like, what's wrong, with Mom? I'm in the driveway. Just eat almost shut on somebody. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, he was touching me. He was opening up my voice. Glory to God. He put a word in my heart. And he made my calling and election sure. And he took away that doubt and that fear. And I knew from that point on that he was going to be with me, that he was for me and not against me. And he was going to make a way through this wilderness, through these dark days that lie ahead, that he's my blessed hope. Glory to God. And as the days have gone on, I have received more and more and more strength. And like I shared this morning, I wanted an instantaneous healing. I just wanted to my voice to be completely restored. I wanted to be able to stand before you tonight and have full strength in my voice and, and not have any hindrance at all. But I believe what the Lord showed me is that just like how he healed those ten lepers, it was as they went. Lord, I'm still going to serve you if I have to speak this way the rest of my life. I'm still going to give him praise and glory, and I'm still going to proclaim his word. And y'all just have to deal with it. (laughs) Glory to God. But I do believe that he is touching me and restoring my voice. And, And as I have gone through these days, he has given me more and more and more strength. And so I want you to continue believing with me that he's going to keep touching me. Glory to God. And so here um, in the fourth chapter of Judges, we have Deborah. She's the fourth judge out of the 12 judges. And um, at that time, there was no one who would rise up to lead God's people. And she would sit under a palm tree, and she would give advice to the people. They would come and stand in line to hear um, what she had to say. She was the only one who had a vision of what God could really do, what he desired to do. And he wanted to set his people free from their oppressors. And she had to send for Barak, the warrior. She had to call for him to even come. And he refused to do his job when she said, you know the Lord has called you to go into battle. And he's already said he's going to give you the victory. But he was hesitant. And he said, I'm not going to go unless you go with me. You see, God had given her the vision And so she agrees to go with him. Israel at that time had been plagued for 20 years by their enemy, the Canaanites. And the captain of the army, Sisera, he had oppressed, the word of God says, he had oppressed them mightily. Do you feel mightily oppressed tonight? He had frightened them and terrorized them. 
So Deborah, she went with Barak into battle, even though she was unprepared and they had an army that was few in number and ill-equipped. She would not have been man's choice, but thank God he looks on the heart. Thank God there is no respecter of persons, male or female, Jew or Greek, young or old. He will use who he chooses. And how dare we put God in a box and say he will or he won't or he only if we and then he No, you can't do my God that way. His ways are past finding out. Glory to God. He will use whom he chooses. And we need some more Deborahs and Jails to rise up, to take the hammer in the hand, to drive it through those evil spirits that come against us, mighty warriors who hear that call that the dry bones will live again and will rise up as a mighty army and go forth in power and in anointing in these last days because we are going to be fighting The good fight of faith. You've already entered into it, but in these last days, the spiritual warfare, it's become heightened. And if you're not careful, and if you're just lazy about it and apathetic about it, the enemy is going to come in and take everything that you own. You have got to stand your ground. You have got to stake a great claim through Jesus Christ. As for me and my house, as for me and my church, me and my family, my community, we're going to serve the Lord and we can take our nation back. Glory to God. If we will take a stand in these last days. He said if he could only find just a faithful few, he would spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He will spare our nation if we will take a stand for righteousness. Glory to God. Glory to God. It is God's will for everyone who belongs to him to have victory over the powers of darkness. He never intended for you to lose a single battle if we only knew who we are in Christ. Glory to God. God won a great victory through Jael as she bravely drove that tent peg into the oppressor's head. She nailed his head to the ground just as sin and every evil work of darkness was nailed to that cross with Jesus Christ. The word of God says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which was contrary to us, that he took it out of the way. He nailed it to his cross. He spoiled principalities that day. He made show of them openly. He won the victory that day for you. It's already been done, nailed to the cross, defeated. How dare we let that thing resurrect and rise back up again? We've got to put Satan in his place. He's already been defeated. It's dead. It's buried. It is over. Glory to God. Nail it to the cross tonight. The word of God says that Jael was blessed among women. The only other time that we see that is when the Bible speaks of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And that shows you just how important this victory was. And it gave them peace for 40 years. And in chapter 5, we read the song of Deborah. And it tells the story of the victory. How many of you know that after the victory is won, you better give God praise. You better sing a song of triumph. Glory to God. He is worthy of the praise. You praise him before. You praise him during the battle. And you better praise him when the victory is won because he gets all the glory. Glory to God. It also lists the tribes that came to their assistance and helped and those who did not. Those who made excuses, like the tribe of Reuben that was too greedy, caring about their own flock, too inwardly focused to get involved in the fight. Gad, he said, it's not my fight. This doesn't apply to me. I'm going to stay on the other side of the Jordan. I want to avoid this controversy. 
the city of Mersog did the same thing. They were a nearby city and they could have helped, but they refused. They said, we're just going to stay neutral. This is not our battle to fight. The tribes of Asher and Dan, they continued on with their business as usual. They had a sailing business where they would unload cargo and, and take shipments from one place to the other. And so they needed their money. And so it lists them and says that they were, they were actually in opposition to the work that the Lord was trying to do because they didn't get involved. How many of you know that to whom much is given, much is required? And we can't just stand idly by and say, oh, we're just going to be neutral. You know, when we think about things, persecution that's going on in other countries, missionary work that's taking place, and we just want to turn a blind eye because we're so blessed in this nation. And we get so accustomed to our way of life, we're not even thinking about what they're facing. We need to intercede in prayer. We need to give to that work. We need to get involved as much as we can. Aren't you glad someone shared this great gospel with you? It had to come to you some way, by some means, by some individual who was willing to go and tell and the people that sent them and the funds that were made available for them to go. It's our duty, our obligation, our responsibility to share this gospel to the four corners of the earth. It is the Great Commission is what he has left in the hands of the church. But we become so inwardly focused. Just ours, our little group, our little flock. And we don't want to let anyone in. And we don't want to go out and compel others to come. And we want to enforce all these rules and regulations of what we think church should be. And when religious man gets involved, the vision dies. God will call an individual as he has called you. He will give you a vision to fulfill that call. And he will give you provision to make it possible. He will send those your way to help you and assist you. He will give you everything that you need. But get ready because then comes division. Because Satan is going to try to come and tear down and kill what God has given you. Division. The vision dies. That's what division is. So you need to recognize that and take a stand against it. There are going to be naysayers and complainers and critics who come our way. They already have. We've been hearing it. Brother Luke's left the message. He's not preaching the right message anymore. There's too much of a focus on love. Could there be such a thing? Oh, there's no dress code there. People just wear whatever they want. I mean, there's no regulation whatsoever. How can that be? He's letting people in off the streets. Just anybody that wants to can just walk into his church. It doesn't matter their race, their culture, their nationality, their religious beliefs, if they're saved, if they're not. He's letting in the drug addicts and the jailbirds and the prostitutes and whatever's going on out there. His doors are wide open to it. He's letting the women preach. You're really going off the deep end. And he's letting the kids go wild. His kids just do whatever they want to do in church. Nobody's getting a handle on those kids. Oh, I thought the word of God said, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. He said it would be better for you to have a millstone tied about your neck and have you be cast into the sea than to touch one of his little ones. Let them come. Let them worship. Let them shout. Let them run. Let them praise. Let them sing. Let them preach. Let them play. Glory to God. Set them loose. Satan wants this generation. He knows if he can get the next generation, the church dies. He's going he's gonna to kill the church, and he's going after our kids. And if we don't wake up, how many churches just put them on the back burner and they just push them aside because their time hasn't come? How do we get to decide when their time comes? If they are saved and bought with the blood of Jesus and called and anointed and the Spirit of God moves upon them to do something, God forbid that I'm in the way. 
God forbid. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Touch not my anointed, young or old. They say these people are too happy. They're just happy all the time. I mean, how is there so much joy? Well, that's a fruit of the Spirit, right? I mean, I think we're supposed to have joy. I think that's what Christians are supposed to do. Oh, they get a little excited with their worship. People call me noisy. I tell them I come from a noisy crew. We shout when we get happy. Glory to God. That's the way we Christians. I wish I could sing tonight. Oh, they call me noisy. I tell them I come from a noisy crew. Because we shout when we get happy. Give the Lord a shout of praise. That's what Christians are supposed to do. Thank you very much. Glory to God. Because this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh no, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. Y'all sing it one time. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the way church is supposed to be. Amen. Oh, he's a young man and he's not operating under an elder. Oh, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) Not only is he not a respecter of persons, but our Lord is not concerned about your age either. And when he moves on you and he says, start a church. You don't have to wait and, until somebody else says you've arrived and, it, and your time has come. You do what God has called you to do. And Brother Luke, you're a perfect example of that. Glory to God. And I know that you said you felt like the Lord had given you this, like a, like a baby, like a child, for you um, to hide it away. And, and he would take you into Egypt to let it grow. So that it would be hidden from enemies that would cause it harm. But I'm telling you something. Baby Moses is getting too big to hide any longer. He's making too much noise to be hidden anymore. So just get ready. Get your basket ready. You're going to have to put this thing in the river. Glory to God. It's getting about ready to take off. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. (laughs) And he's making you like Joseph. I know you feel like you've been from the pit into the hand of Potiphar, into the prison. But get ready. Get ready for your promotion. Because he's going to use you to provide for God's people in a time of famine. You will be the place to come when they are in need of bread. He is going to raise you up to provide in a time of need. And your big brothers are coming. 
and they're going to pay homage to you. And they're going to bow before you. And you will be able to show mercy in a time of judgment. Glory to God. He's going to give you the ability to do that. Glory to God. So I just got to tell you all tonight, get ready. Get ready and buckle up because... This thing is getting ready to take off. Glory to God. You ain't seen nothing yet. If they thought we were acting crazy before. If they thought we were getting too out of hand. Glory to God. Glory to God. It is time to get to the table. It's time to uncork your ball. It's time to let down your nets. It is time to get into the river, glory to God. And wherever this river flows, it will bring life to all who are in the river, glory to God. Don't stay on the sidelines and be dry and stagnant during this time. There is a new season of His glory. Miracles, a mighty harvest is on the way. Do you feel it? Oh, although this evil is rising up and the darkness is trying to overshadow, his light is going to shine. A city set on a hill that can't be hidden. It can't be hidden any longer. It's going to shine. Glory be to God. Just believe for it. I imagine what things must have been like for the early church. They were probably thinking that they were a little too free. (laughs) They're speaking in other tongues. They're proclaiming the name of Jesus. They're saying we're under a new covenant. They're trying to change all our laws and rules and regulations. And they're saying any and all can come. Whosoever will is now able to come and partake. That any can be saved. They must have thought this bunch of crazy young people. What are they doing? And I feel like that's a lot of what we're dealing with too. It's just like how it was in the early church. I've been reading through some in the the book of Acts and I can see so many parallels there. And I just feel like God is using his true church in the last days to be trailblazers through this thing. You know, we may not have it all figured out. We might make a few mistakes, but there is grace. There is an abundance of grace. Glory to God. And he will lead and guide and direct. He is not looking for a perfect people or a perfect church. He is just looking for those who will love. Who will love enough to go out and rescue those. The broken and the hurting and the abandoned. The poor, widowed, orphaned. The rejects. The ones who tried it all, the ones who were looking for love, who couldn't be satisfied, the ones that other churches have turned away because they didn't meet their standards. Glory to God. He wants to send us out to find them, to show them his love and bring them in. Glory to God. Do you believe that? He is able and he loves all. Whosoever will. If they come through these doors, if they accept the Lord Jesus Christ and they are good enough for heaven, then they are good enough to be part of the church. No other stipulations are required. What is the purpose of the church? To make and send forth disciples. That's the whole point. You're not supposed to be perfect before you come in. That's the whole point. You come as you are, and he takes care of it. It's a job of the Holy Spirit to bring the correction. We can guide and we can help, but we have to do it in a spirit of love. And the Lord began to speak into my heart about my calling and and that he would make me a pioneer among women that I would be paving the way for this next generation so they could see that God does use women and speak through women. And the Lord began to deal with me that he isn't 
calling me to preach like a man because I am not a man. Women, God is not calling you to do what he's called you to do in the manner in which a man would. You are not a man. I don't have to tell you that tonight. So what you do for the Lord might be a little different. And we want to compare, especially women preachers want to compare themselves because we haven't been given very many examples to go by other than male examples. But you can also just take it to an individual level. God is not going to call you to preach or to teach or to minister in the exact same fashion as anyone else. You have your own unique being and personality. And you have to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you. There is no magical formula to accomplish the call of God on your life. You don't bring in the anointing or the presence of God or the power of the Holy Spirit by doing these certain things. You are led of the Spirit anointed by the Holy Spirit, and you do as the Spirit tells you to do. That is all that you need. So I'm going to sing if the Spirit says sing. I'm going to preach if the Spirit says preach. I'm going to dance if the Spirit says dance. I'll shout if He says shout. I'm just going to obey the Spirit of the Lord. That's all He's calling any of you to do. Stop comparing yourselves with one another. Let him move on you individually. Get a real relationship with God and all these things will fall off. He will show you what you've been focusing on. Does it matter? We are meant to be different. We have unique callings and gifts and abilities that the body needs. The eye cannot be the ear. The ear can't be the eye. So don't tell me. That God won't move if he desires to move among a group of people who are hungry, who are thirsting, who are crying out and seeking his face and desiring a move of God. That's how all the great moves of God of the past came about, just through prayer and seeking the face of the Lord. No plan, no method, no program. Just the spirit of the living God moving among imperfect individuals. He is molding and making us into his image. That is what the sanctification process is. To be molded into his image, not anyone else's. So be encouraged tonight. He will use you. And don't be afraid to step out and do what you feel he is leading you to do. Let him move on you. Let him move through you to touch others because there is a great work to do. Glory to God. Glory to God. I just want you to stand to your feet tonight. I feel led specifically to pray for people who have been oppressed by the devil, who have felt that weight of heaviness upon them, that it affects your mind, it affects your physical body, it affects your ability to go about your day-to-day tasks, it has an effect on your family and those who are around you. If you need deliverance tonight, it is a real spiritual battle. Do not listen to the lies of the devil. Do not give a single thought to those things as he comes about in his subtle ways. You need to learn how to recognize that evil. We're going to drive the nail through this spirit of darkness tonight. Glory to God. Can you believe with me? The battle belongs to Jesus. The battle belongs to Jesus. Audrey, will you come and sing that? Battle belongs. And then after that, Charlie, if you'll play something for us. Glory to God. It's yours tonight, Lord. We come before you. Oh, Lord, we lay it all at your feet, and we thank you, Lord, that you are able. Glory to God. Glory to God. Press into his presence tonight.